of the decompression zone. Tonight I will be reading for you part two of Jack London's White Fang. Chapter One The Battle of the Fangs it was the she-wolf who had first caught the sound of man's voice and the whining of the sled dogs. And it was the she-wolf who was first to spring away from the cornered man in his circle of dying flame. The pack had been loath to forgo the kill it had hunted down and it lingered for several minutes, making sure of the sounds, and then it too sprang away on the trail made by the she-wolf. Running at the forefront of the pack was a large grey wolf, one of its several leaders. It was he who directed the pack's course on the heels of the she-wolf. It was he who snarled warningly at the younger members of the pack, or slashed at them with his fangs when they ambitiously tried to pass him. And it was he who increased the pace when he sighted the she-wolf, now trotting slowly across the snow. She dropped in alongside by him as though it were her appointed position and took the pace of the pack. He did not snarl at her nor show his teeth when any leap of hers chanced to put her in advance of him. On the contrary, he seemed kindly disposed towards her, too kindly to suit her, for he was prone to run near to her, and when he ran too near it was she who snarled and showed her teeth nor was she above slashing his shoulder sharply on occasion. At such times he betrayed no anger. He merely sprang to the side and ran stiffly ahead for several awkward leaps, in carriage and conduct resembling an abashed country swain. This was his one trouble in the running of the pack, but she had other troubles. On her other side ran a gaunt old wolf, grizzled and marked with the scars of many battles. He ran always on her right side. The fact that he had but one eye, and that the left eye might account for this. He also was addicted to crowding her to veering towards her till his scarred muzzle touched her body, or shoulder, or neck. As with the running mate on the left, she repelled these attentions with her teeth. But when both bestowed their attentions at the same time, she was roughly jostled, being compelled with quick snaps to either side to drive both lovers away and at the same time to maintain her forward leap with the pack, and see the way of her feet before her. At such times her running mates flashed their teeth and growled threateningly across to each other. They might have fought, but even wooing and its rivalry waited upon the more pressing hunger need of the pack. After each repulse, when the old wolf steered abruptly away from the sharp-toothed object of his desire, he shouldered against the young three-year-old that ran on his blind right side. This young wolf had attained his full size, and, considering the weak and famished condition of the pack, he possessed more than the average vigor and spirit. Nevertheless, he ran with his head, even with the shoulder of his one-eyed elder. When he ventured to run abreast of the older wolf, which was seldom, a snarl and a snap sent him back even with the shoulder again. 
Sometimes, however, he dropped cautiously and slowly behind and edged in between the old leader and the she-wolf. This was doubly resented, even triply resented. When she snarled her displeasure, the old leader would whirl on the three-year-old. Sometimes she whirled with him, and sometimes the young leader on the left whirled too. At such times, confronted by three sets of savage teeth, the young wolf stopped precipitately, throwing himself back on his haunches with forelegs stiff, mouth menacing and mane bristling. This confusion in the front of the moving pack always caused confusion in the rear. The wolves behind collided with the young wolf and expressed their displeasure by administering sharp nips on his hind legs and flanks. He was laying up trouble for himself, for lack of food and short tempers went together. But with the boundless faith of youth, he persisted in repeating the maneuver every little while though it never succeeded in gaining anything for him but discomfiture. Had there been food, lovemaking and fighting would have gone on apace, and the pack formation would have been broken up. But the situation of the pack was desperate. It was lean with long-standing hunger. It ran below its ordinary speed. At the rear limped the weak members, the very young and the very old. At the front were the strongest, yet all were more like skeletons than full-bodied wolves. Nevertheless, with the exception of the ones that limped, the movements of the animals were effortless and tireless. Their stringy muscles seemed fonts of inexhaustible energy. Behind every steel-like contraction of a muscle lay another steel-like contraction, and another, and another, apparently without end. They ran many miles that day. They ran through the night, and the next day found them still running. They were running over the surface of a world frozen and dead. No life stirred. They alone moved through the vast inertness. They alone were alive, and they sought for other things that were alive in order that they might devour them and continue to live. They crossed low divides and ranged a dozen small streams in a lower-lying country before their quest was rewarded. Then they came upon Moose. It was a big bull they first found. Here was meat and life, and it was guarded by no mysterious fires, no flying missiles of flame. Splay hoofs and palmated antlers they knew and they flung their customary patience and caution to the wind. It was a brief fight and fierce. The big bull was beset on every side. He ripped them open or split their skulls with shrewdly driven blows of his great hoofs. He crushed them and broke them on his large horns. He stamped them into the snow under him in the wallowing struggle. But he was foredoomed, and he went down with the she-wolf tearing savagely at his throat, and with other teeth fixed everywhere upon him, devouring him alive, before ever his last struggles ceased, or his last damage had been wrought. There was food in plenty. 
The bull weighed over 800 pounds, fully 20 pounds of meat per mouth for the 40 odd wolves of the pack. But if they could fast prodigiously, they could feed prodigiously, and soon a few scattered bones were all that remained of the splendid live brute that had faced the pack a few hours before. There was now much resting and sleeping, with full stomachs bickering and quarreling began among the younger males, and this continued through the few days that followed before the breaking up of the pack. The famine was over. The wolves were now in the country of game, and though they still hunted in pack, they hunted more cautiously cutting out heavy cows or crippled old bulls from the small moose herds they ran across. There came a day in this land of plenty when the wolf pack split in half and went in different directions. The she-wolf, the young leader on her left and the one-eyed elder on her right, led their half of the pack down to the Mackenzie River and across into the lake country to the east. Each day this remnant of the pack dwindled. Two by two, male and female, the wolves were deserting. Occasionally a solitary male was driven out by the sharp teeth of his rivals. In the end, there remained only four. The she-wolf, the young leader, the one-eyed one, and the ambitious three-year-old. The she-wolf had by now developed a ferocious temper. Her three suitors all bore the marks of her teeth. Yet they never replied in kind, never defended themselves against her. They turned their shoulders to her most savage slashes, and with wagging tails and mincing steps strove to placate her wrath. But if they were all mildness towards her, they were all fierceness toward one another. The three-year-old grew too ambitious in his fierceness. He caught the one-eyed elder on his blind side and ripped his ear into ribbons. Though the grizzled old fellow could see only on one side, against the youth and vigor of the other he brought into play the wisdom of long years of experience. His lost eye and his scarred muzzle bore evidence to the nature of his experience. He had survived too many battles to be in doubt for a moment about what to do. The battle began fairly, but it did not end fairly. There was no telling what the outcome would have been, for the third wolf joined the elder, and together, old leader and young leader, they attacked the ambitious three-year-old and proceeded to destroy him. He was beset on either side by the merciless fangs of his erstwhile comrades. Forgotten were the days they had hunted together, the game they had pulled down, the famine they had suffered. That business was a thing of the past. The business of love was at hand, ever a sterner and crueler business than that of food getting. And in the meanwhile the she-wolf, the cause of it all, sat down contently on her haunches and watched. She was even pleased. This was her day, and it came not often when manes bristled and fangs smote fang or ripped and tore the yielding flesh all for possession of her.
And in the business of love, the three-year-old who had made this his first adventure upon it, yielded up his life. On either side of his body stood his two rivals. They were gazing at the she-wolf. She sat smiling in the snow. But the elder leader was wise, very wise, in love even as in battle. The younger leader turned his head to lick a wound on his shoulder. The curve of his neck was turned towards his rival. With his one eye, the elder saw the opportunity. He darted in low and closed with his fangs. It was a long, ripping slash, and deep as well. His teeth, in passing, burst the wall of the great vein of the throat. Then he leapt clear. The young leader snarled terribly, but his snarl broke midmost into a tickling cough. Bleeding and coughing, already stricken, he sprang at the elder and fought while life faded from him. His legs going weak beneath him, the light of day dulling on his eyes, his blows and springs falling shorter and shorter. And all the while, the she wolf sat on her haunches and smiled. She was made glad in vague ways by the battle, for this was the love making of the wild the sex tragedy of the natural world that was tragedy only to those that died. To those that survived it was not a tragedy, but a realization and achievement. When the young leader lay in the snow and moved no more, one eye stalked over to the she-wolf. His carriage was one of mingled triumph and caution. He was plainly expectant of a rebuff, and he was just as plainly surprised when her teeth did not flash out at him in anger. For the first time she met him with a kindly manner. She sniffed noses with him and even condescended to leap about and frisk and play with him in a quite puppyish fashion. And he, for all his grey years and sage experience, behaved quite as puppyishly and even a little more foolishly. Forgotten already were the vanquished rivals, and the love tale read written on the snow. Forgotten, save once, when old one eye stopped for a moment to lick his stiffening wounds. Then it was that his lips half writhed into a snarl, and the hair of his neck and shoulders involuntarily bristled. While he half crouched for a spring, his claws spasmodically clutched into the snow surface for firmer footing. But it was all forgotten the next moment as he sprang after the she-wolf, who was coyly leading him a chase through the woods. After that they ran side by side, like good friends who have come to an understanding. The days passed by, and they kept together, hunting the meat and killing and eating it in common. After a time the she-wolf began to grow restless. She seemed to be searching for something that she could not find. The hollows on the fallen trees seemed to attract her, and she spent much time nosing about among the larger snow-piled crevices in the rocks and in the caves of overhanging banks. Old One-Eye was not interested at all, but he followed her good-naturedly in her quest, and when her investigations in particular places were unusually protracted, he would lie down and wait until she was ready to go on. 
They did not remain in one place, but traveled across country until they regained the Mackenzie River, down which they slowly went, leaving it often to hunt game along the small streams that entered it, but always returning to it again. Sometimes they chanced upon other wolves, usually in pairs, but there was no friendliness of intercourse displayed on either side, no gladness at meeting, no desire to return to the pack formation. Several times they encountered solitary wolves. They were always males, and they were pressingly insistent on joining with one eye and his mate. This he resented, and when she stood shoulder to shoulder with him, bristling and showing her teeth, the aspiring solitary ones would back off, turn tail, and continue on their lonely way. One moonlit night, running through the quiet forest, one eye suddenly halted. His muzzle went up, his tail stiffened, and his nostrils dilated as he scented the air. One foot also he held up, after the manner of a dog. He was not satisfied, and he continued to smell the air striving to understand the message borne upon it to him. One careless sniff had satisfied his mate, and she trotted on to reassure him. Though he followed her, he was still dubious, and he could not forbear an occasional halt, in order more carefully to study the warning. She crept out cautiously on the edge of a larger open space in the midst of the trees. For some time she stood alone, then one eye creeping and calling, every sense on the alert, every hair radiating infinite suspicion, joined her. They stood side by side, watching and listening and smelling. To their ears came the sound of dogs wrangling and scuffling, the guttural cries of men, the sharper voices of scolding women, and once the shrill and plaintive cry of a child. With the exception of the huge bulks of the skin lodges, little could be seen save the flames of the fire broken by the movements of the intervening bodies and the smoke rising slowly on the quiet air. But to their nostrils came the myriad smells of an Indian camp, carrying a story that was largely incomprehensible to one eye, but every detail of which the she-wolf knew. She was strangely stirred, and sniffed and sniffed with an increasing delight. But old one eye was doubtful. He betrayed his apprehension and started tentatively to go. She turned and touched his neck with her muzzle in a reassuring way, then regarded the camp again. A new wistfulness was in her face but it was not the wistfulness of hunger. She was thrilling to a desire that urged her to go forward, to be in closer to that fire, to be squabbling with the dogs, and to be avoiding and dodging the stumbling feet of men. One eye moved impatiently beside her, her unrest came back upon her, and she knew again her pressing need to find the thing for which she searched. She turned and trotted back into the forest, to the great relief of one eye, who trotted a little to the fro until they were well within the shelter of the trees. As they slid along, noiseless as shadows, in the moonlight, 
they came upon a runway. Both noses went down to the footprints in the snow. These footprints were very fresh. One eye ran ahead, cautiously, his mate at his heels. The broad pads of their feet were spread wide and in contact with the snow were like a velvet. One eye caught sight of a dim movement of white in the midst of the white. His sliding gait had been deceptively swift, but it was as nothing to the speed at which he now ran. Before him was bounding the faint patch of white he had discovered. They were running along a narrow alley, flanked on either side by a growth of young spruce. Through the trees, the mouth of the alley could be seen opening out on a moonlit glade. Old One Eye was rapidly overhauling the fleeing shape of white. Bound by bound, he gained. Now he was upon it. One leap more and his teeth would be sinking into it. But that leap was never made. High in the air and straight up soared the shape of white. Now a struggling snowshoe rabbit that leaped and bounded. Executing a fantastic dance there above him in the air and never once returning to earth. One eye sprang back with a snort of sudden fright, then shrank down to the snow and crouched, snarling threats at this thing of fear he did not understand. But the she-wolf coolly thrust past him. She poised for a moment, then sprang for the dancing rabbit. She too soared high, but not so high as the quarry and her teeth clipped emptily together with a metallic snap. She made another leap, and another. Her mate had slowly relaxed from his crouch and was watching her. He now evinced displeasure at her repeated failures, and himself made a mighty spring upward. His teeth closed upon the rabbit, and he bore it back to earth with him. But at the same time, there was a suspicious crackling movement beside him, and his astonished eye saw a young spruce sapling bending down above him to strike him. His jaws let go their grip, and he leapt backwards to escape this strange danger, his lips drawn back from his fangs, his throat snarling, every hair bristling with rage and fright. And in that moment, the sapling reared its slender length upright, and the rabbit soared dancing in the air again. The she-wolf was angry. She sank her fangs into her mate's shoulder in reproof, and he, frightened, unaware of what constituted this new onslaught, struck back ferociously, and in still greater fright, ripping down the side of the she-wolf's muzzle. For him to resent such reproof was equally unexpected to her, and she sprang upon him in snarling indignation. Then he discovered his mistake, and tried to placate her. But she proceeded to punish him roundly until he gave over all attempts to placation, and whirled in a circle his head away from her, his shoulders receiving the punishment of her teeth. In the meantime, the rabbit danced above them in the air. The she-wolf sat down in the snow, and old one ear, now more in fear of his mate than of the mysterious sapling, again sprang for the rabbit. As he sank back with it between his teeth, he kept his eye on the sapling. As before, it followed him back to earth. He crouched down under the impeding blow, his hair bristling, but his teeth still keeping tight hold of the rabbit. But the blow did not fall. The sapling remained bent above him, 
When he moved, it moved, and he growled at it through his clenched jaws. When he remained still, it remained still, and he concluded it was safer to continue remaining still. Yet the warm blood of the rabbit tasted good in his mouth. It was his mate who relieved him from the quandary in which he found himself. She took the rabbit from him, and while the sapling swayed and teetered threateningly above her, she calmly gnawed off the rabbit's head. At once the sapling shot up, and after that gave no more trouble. Remaining in the decorous and perpendicular position in which nature had intended it to grow. Then between them the she-wolf and one eye devoured the game which the mysterious sapling had caught for them. There were other runways and alleys where rabbits were hanging in the air, and the wolf bear prospected them all. The she-wolf leading the way, old one eye following and observant, learning the method of robbing snares, a knowledge destined to stand him in good stead in the days to come. Chapter 2 The Lair For two days the she-wolf and one eye hung about the Indian camp. He was worried and apprehensive, yet the camp lured his mate, and she was loath to depart. But when one morning the air was rent with the report of a rifle close at hand, and the bullet smashed against the tree trunk several inches from one eye's head. They hesitated no more, but went off on a long, swinging lope that put quick miles between them and the danger. They did not go far, a couple of days' journey. The she-wolf's need to find the thing for which she searched had now become imperative. She was getting very heavy, and could run but slowly. Once in the pursuit of a rabbit, which she ordinarily would have caught with ease, she gave over and lay down and rested. One eye came to her, but when he touched her neck gently with his muzzle, she snapped at him with such quick fierceness that he tumbled over backward and cut a ridiculous figure in his effort to escape her teeth. Her temper was now shorter than ever, but he had become more patient than ever and more salacious. And then she found the thing for which she sought. It was a few miles up a small stream that in the summertime flowed into the Mackenzie but that then was frozen over and frozen down to its rocky bottom. A dead stream of solid white from source to mouth. The she-wolf was trotting wearily along, her mate well in advance when she came upon the overhanging high clay bank. She turned aside and trotted over to it. The wear and tear of spring storms and melting snow had underwashed the bank, and in one place had made a small cave out of a narrow fissure. She paused at the mouth of the cave and looked the wall over carefully. Then on one side and the other she ran along the base of the wall to where its abrupt bank merged from the softer lined landscape. Returning to the cave, she entered its narrow mouth. For a short three feet, she was compelled to crouch. Then the walls widened and rose higher in a little round chamber, near six feet in diameter. The roof barely cleared her head. It was dry and cozy. She inspected it with painstaking care, while one eye, who had returned, stood in the entrance and patiently watched her. 
She dropped her head with her nose to the ground and directed towards a point near to her closely bunched feet. And around this point, she encircled several times. Then, with a tired sigh that was almost a grunt, she curled her body in, relaxed her legs, and dropped down her head toward the entrance. One eye, with pointed, interested ears, laughed at her, and beyond, outlined against the white light, she could see the brush of his tail waving good-naturedly. Her own ears, with a snuggling movement, laid their sharp points backward and down against the head for a moment while her mouth opened and her tongue lolled peaceably out. And in this way she expressed that she was pleased and satisfied. One eye was hungry, though he lay down in the entrance and slept. His sleep was fitful. He kept awaking and cocking his ears at the bright world without where the April sun was blazing across the snow. When he dozed, upon his ears would steal the faint whispers of hidden trickles of running water, and he would rouse and listen intently. The sun had come back, and all the awakening Northland world was calling him. Life was stirring, the feel of spring was in the air, the feel of growing life under the snow of sap ascending in the trees, of buds bursting the shackles of the frost. He cast anxious glances at his mate, but she showed no desire to get up. He looked outside, and half a dozen snowbirds fluttered across his field of vision. He started to get up, then looked back to his mate again and settled down and dozed. A shrill and minute singing stole upon his ear. Once and twice he sleepily brushed his nose with his paw. Then he woke up. There, buzzing in the air at the tip of his nose, was a lone mosquito. It was a full-grown mosquito, one that had lain frozen in a dry log all winter, and that had now been thawed out by the sun. He could resist the call of the world no longer. Besides, he was hungry. He crawled over to his mate and tried to persuade her to get up. But she only snarled at him, and he walked out alone into the bright sunshine to find the snow surface soft underfoot and the traveling difficult. He went up the frozen bed of the stream, where the snow, shaded by the trees, was yet hard and crystalline. He was gone eight hours, and he came back through the darkness, hungrier than when he had started. He had found game, but he had not caught it. He had broken through the melting snow crust and wallowed, while the snowshoe rabbits had skimmed along on top lightly as ever. He paused at the mouth of the cave with a sudden shock of suspicion. Faint, strange sounds came from within. They were sounds not made by his mate, and yet they were remotely familiar. He bellied cautiously inside and was met by a warning snarl from the she-wolf. This he received without perturbation though he obeyed it by keeping his distance. But he remained interested in the other sounds, faint, muffled sobbings and slubberings. His mate warned him irritably away, and he curled up and slept in the entrance. When morning came and a dim light pervaded the lair, he again sought after the source of the remotely familiar sounds. There was a new note in his mate's warning snarl. 
It was a jealous note, and he was very careful in keeping a respectful distance. Nevertheless, he made out, sheltering between her legs against the length of her body, five strange little bundles of life, very feeble, very helpless, making tiny whimpering noises with eyes that did not open to the light. He was surprised. It was not the first time in his long and successful life that this thing had happened. It had happened many times, yet each time it was as fresh a surprise as ever to him. His mate looked at him anxiously. Every little while she emitted a low growl, and at times, when it seemed to her, he approached too near. The growl shot up in her throat to a sharp snarl. Of her own experience, she had no memory of the thing happening. But in her instinct, which was the experience of all the mothers of wolves, there lurked a memory of fathers that had eaten their newborn and helpless progeny. It manifested itself as a fear strong within her that made her prevent one eye from more closely inspecting the cubs he had fathered. But there was no danger. Old One Eye was feeling the urge of an impulse that was, in turn, an instinct that had come down to him from all the fathers of wolves. He did not question it, nor puzzle over it. It was there, in the fiber of his being, and it was the most natural thing in the world that he should obey it by turning his back on his newborn family and by trotting out and away on the meat trail whereby he lived. Five or six miles from the lair, the stream divided, its forks going off among the mountains at a right angle. Here, leading up the left fork, he came upon a fresh track. He smelled it and found it so recent that he crouched swiftly and looked in the direction in which it disappeared. Then he turned deliberately and took the right fork. The footprint was much larger than the one his own feet made, and he knew that in the wake of such a trail there was little meat for him. Half a mile up the right fork his quick ears caught the sound of gnawing teeth. He stalked the quarry and found it to be a porcupine, standing upright against the tree and trying his teeth on the bark. One eye approached carefully but hopelessly. He knew the breed, though he had never met it so far north before, and never in his long life had the porcupine served him for a meal. But he had long since learned that there was such a thing as chance or opportunity, and he continued to draw near. There was never any telling what might happen, for with life things, events were somehow always happening differently. The porcupine rolled itself into a ball, radiating long, sharp needles in all directions that defied attack. In his youth, one eye had once sniffed too near a similar, apparently inert ball of quills, and had the tail flicked out suddenly in his face. One quill he had carried away in his muzzle, where it had remained for weeks, a rankling flame until it finally worked out. So he lay down in a comfortable crouching position, his nose fully a foot away and out of the line of the tail. Thus he waited, keeping perfectly quiet. There was no telling. Something might happen. The porcupine might unroll. There might be opportunity for a deft and rippling thrust of paw into the tender, unguarded belly. But at the end of half an hour he arose, growled wrathfully at the motionless ball, and trotted on. He had waited too often and futilely in the past for porcupines to unroll, to waste any more time. 
he continued up the right fork. The day wore along, and nothing rewarded his hunt. The urge of his awakened instinct of fatherhood was strong upon him. He must find meat. In the afternoon, he blundered upon a ptarmigan. He came out of a thicket and found himself face to face with the snow-witted bird. It was sitting on a log, not a foot beyond the end of his nose. Each saw the other. The bird made a startled rise, but he struck it with his paw and smashed it down to earth. Then pounced upon it and caught it in his teeth as it scuttled across the snow, trying to rise in the air again. As his teeth crunched through the tender flesh and fragile bones, he began naturally to eat. Then he remembered, and turning on the back track, started for home, carrying the ptarmigan in his mouth. A mile above the forks, running velvet-footed, as was his custom. A glided shadow that cautiously prospected each new vista of the trail, he came upon later imprints of the larger tracks he had discovered in the early morning. As the track led his way, he followed, prepared to meet the maker of it at every turn of the stream. He slid his head around a corner of rock, where began an unusual large bend in the stream, and his quick eyes made out something that sent him crouching swiftly down. It was the maker of the track, a large female lynx. She was crouching as he had crouched once that day, in front of her the tight-rolled ball of quills. If he had been the gliding shadow before, he now became the ghost of such a shadow. As he crept and circled round and came up well to leeward of the silent, motionless pair. He lay down in the snow, depositing the ptarmigan beside him, and with eyes peering through the needles of a low-growing spruce, he watched the play of life before him. The waiting lynx and the waiting porcupine, each intent on life, and such was the curiousness of the game. The way of life for one lay in the eating of the other, and the way of life for the other lay in being not eaten. While old eye, the wolf crouching in the covert, played his part, too, in the game, waiting for some strange freak of chance that might help him on the meat trail, which was his way of life. Half an hour passed, an hour, and nothing happened. The ball of quills might have been a stone for all it moved. The lynx might have been frozen to marble, and old one eye might have been dead. Yet all three animals were keyed to a tenseness of living that was almost painful, and scarcely ever would it come to them to be more alive than they were then in their seeming petrification. One eye moved slightly and peered forth with increased eagerness. Something was happening. The porcupine had at last decided that its enemy had gone away. Slowly, cautiously, it was unrolling its ball of impregnable armor. It was agitated by no tremor of anticipation. Slowly, slowly, the bristling ball straightened out and lengthened. One eye, watching, felt a sudden moistness in his mouth and a drooling of saliva. Involuntary, excited by the living meat that was spreading itself like a repast before him. Not quite entirely had the porcupine unrolled when it discovered its enemy. In that instant the lynx struck. The blow was like a flash of light. 
and the paw with rigid claws curving like talons shot under the tender belly and came back with a swift ripping movement. Had the porcupine been entirely unrolled, or had it not discovered its enemy a fraction of a second before the blow was struck, the paw would have escaped unscathed. But a side flick of the tail sank sharp quills into it as it was withdrawn. Everything had happened at once. The blow, the counterblow, the squeal of agony from the porcupine the big cat's squall of sudden hurt and astonishment. One eye half arose in his excitement, his ears up, his tail straight out and quivering behind him. The lynx's bad temper got to the best of her. She sprang savagely at the thing that had hurt her, but the porcupine, squealing and grunting, with disrupted anatomy, trying feebly to roll up into its ball protection, flicked out its tail again. And again the big cat squalled with hurt and astonishment. Then she fell to backing away and sneezing, her nose bristling with quills like a monstrous pincushion. She brushed her nose with her paws, trying to dislodge the fiery darts thrust it into the snow and rubbed it against twigs and branches, and all the time leaping about, ahead, sideway, up and down, in a frenzy of pain and fright. She sneezed continually, and her stub of a tail was doing its best towards lashing about by giving quick, violent jerks. She quit her antics and quieted down for a long minute. One eye watched, and even he could not repress a start and an involuntary bristling of hair along his back when she suddenly leapt, without warning, straight up in the air and at the same time emitting a long and most terrible squall. Then she sprang away, up the trail, squalling with every leap she made. It was not until her racket had faded away in the distance and died out that one eye ventured forth. He walked as delicately as though all the snow were carpeted with porcupine quills, erect and ready to pierce the soft pads of his feet. The porcupine met his approach with a fury squealing and the clashing of its long teeth. It had managed to roll up in a ball again, but it was not quite the old compact ball. Its muscles were too much torn for that. It had been ripped almost in half and was still bleeding profusely. One eye scooped out mouthfuls of blood-soaked snow and chewed and tasted and swallowed. This served as a relish and his hunger increased mightily, but he was too old in the world to forget his caution. He waited. He lay down and waited while the porcupine grated its teeth and uttered grunts and sobs and occasional sharp little squeals. In a little while, one eye noticed that the quills were drooping, and that a great quivering had set up. The quivering came to an end suddenly. There was a final, defined clash of the long teeth. Then all the quills drooped quite down, and the body relaxed and moved no more. With a nervous, shrinking paw, one eye stretched out the porcupine to its full length and turned it over on its back. Nothing had happened. It was surely dead. He studied it intently for a moment, then took a careful grip with his teeth and started off down the stream, partly carrying, partly dragging the porcupine with head turned to the side so as to avoid stepping on the prickly mass. He recollected something, dropped the burden, and trotted back to where he had left, the ptarmigan. 
He did not hesitate a moment. He knew clearly what was to be done, and this he did by promptly eating the ptarmigan. Then he returned and took up his burden. When he dragged the result of his day's hunt into the cave, the she-wolf inspected it, turned her muzzle to him, and lightly licked him on the neck. But the next instant she was warning him away from the cubs with a snarl that was less harsh than usual and that was more apologetic than menacing. Her instinctive fear of the father of her progeny was toning down. He was behaving as a wolf father should and manifesting no unholy desire to devour the young lives she had brought into the world. Chapter 3 The Grey Cub He was different from his brothers and sisters. Their hair already betrayed the reddish hue inherited from their mother, the she-wolf. While he alone in this particular took after his father, he was the one little grey cub of the letter. He had bred true to the straight wolf stock. In fact, he had bred true to the old one eye himself, physically, with but a single exception, and that was he had two eyes to his father's one. The grey cub's eyes had not been opened long, yet already he could see with steady clearness and while his eyes were still closed, he had felt, tasted, and smelled. He knew his two brothers and his two sisters very well. He had begun to romp with them in a feeble, awkward way, and even to squabble, his little throat vibrating with a queer, rasping noise, the forerunner of the growl, as he worked himself into a passion. And long before his eyes had opened, he had learned by touch, taste, and smell to know his mother. A fount of warmth and liquid food and tenderness. She possessed a gentle, caressing tongue that soothed him when it passed over his soft little body. And that impelled him to snuggle close against her and to doze off to sleep. Most of the first month of his life had been passed thus in sleeping, but now he could see quite well, and he stayed awake for longer periods of time, and he was coming to learn his world quite well. His world was gloomy, but he did not know that, for he knew no other world. It was dim lighted, but his eyes had never had to adjust themselves to any other light. His world was very small, its limits were the walls of the lair, but as he had no knowledge of the wide world outside, he was never oppressed by the narrow confines of his existence. But he had early discovered that one wall of his world was different from the rest. This was the mouth of the cave and the source of light. He had discovered that it was different from the other walls long before he had any thought of his own, any conscious volitions. It had been an irresistible attraction before ever his eyes opened and looked upon it. The light from it had beaten upon his sealed lids, and the eyes and the optic nerves had pulsated to little sparkling flashes, warm colored and strangely pleasing. The life of his body and of every fiber of his body, the life of that was the very substance of his body, and that was apart from his own personal life had yearned towards this light and urged his body towards it, in the same way that the cunning chemistry of a plant urges it toward the sun. Always in the beginning, before his conscious life dawned, he had crawled towards the mouth of the cave. 
and in this his brothers and sisters were one with him. Never in that period did any of them crawl towards the dark corners of the back wall. The light drew them as if they were plants. The chemistry of the life that composed them demanded the light as a necessity of being. And their little puppet bodies crawled blindly and chemically like the tendrils of a vine. Later on, when each developed individuality and became personally conscious of impulsions and desires, the attraction of the light increased. They were always crawling and sprawling toward it and being driven back from it by their mother. It was in this way that the grey cub learned other attributes of his mother than the soft, soothing tongue. In his insistent crawling towards the light, he discovered in her a nose that with a sharp nudge administered rebuke, and later a paw that crushed him down and rolled him over and over with swift, calculating stroke. Thus he learned hurt, and on top of it he learned to avoid hurt, first by not incurring the risk of it, and second, when he had incurred the risk, by dodging and by retreating. These were the conscious actions and were the results of his first generalizations upon the world. Before that he had recoiled automatically from hurt, as he had crawled automatically toward the light. After that he recoiled from hurt because he knew that it was hurt. He was a fierce little cub. So were his brothers and sisters. It was to be expected. He was a carnivorous animal. He came of a breed of meat killers and meat eaters. His father and mother lived wholly upon meat. The milk he had sucked with his first flickering life was milk transformed directly from meat. And now, at a month old, when his eyes had been open for but a week, he was beginning himself to eat meat. Meat half digested by the she-wolf and disgorged for the five growing cups that already made too great demand upon her breast. But he was, further, the fiercest of the litter. He could make a louder rasping growl than any of them. His tiny rages were much more terrible than theirs. It was he that first learned the trick of rolling a fellow cup over with a cunning paw stroke. And it was he that first gripped another cup by the ear and pulled and tugged and growled through jaws tight clenched. And suddenly it was he that caused the mother the most trouble in keeping her litter from the mouth of the cave. The fascination of the light for the grey cup increased from day to day. He was perpetually departing on yard-long adventures toward the cave entrance, and as perpetually being driven back. Only he did not know it for an entrance. He did not know anything about entrances passages whereby one goes from one place to another place. He did not know any other place, much less of a way to get there. So to him the entrance of the cave was a wall, a wall of light. As the sun was to the outside dweller, this wall was to him the sun of his world. It attracted him as a candle attracts a moth. He was always driven to attain it. The life that was so swiftly expanding within him urged him continually towards the wall of light. The life that was within him knew that it was the one way out, the way he was predestined to tread. But he himself did not know anything about it. He did not know there was any outside at all. There was one strange thing about this wall of light. His father, 
He had already come to recognize his father as the one other dweller in the world, a creature like his mother who slept near the light and was a bringer of meat. His father had a way of walking right into the white far wall and disappearing. The grey cub could not understand this, though never permitted by his mother to approach that wall. He had approached the other walls and encountered a hard obstruction on the end of his tender nose. This hurt, and after several such adventures he left the walls alone. Without thinking about it, he accepted this disappearing into the wall as a peculiarity of his father, as milk and half-digested meat were peculiarities of his mother. In fact, the grey cub was not given to thinking, at least to the kind of thinking customary of men. His brain worked in dim ways, yet his conclusions were as sharp and distinct as those achieved by man. He had a method of accepting things, without questioning the why and the wherefore. In reality, this was the act of classification. He was never disturbed over why a thing happened. How it happened was sufficient for him. Thus, when he had bumped his nose on the back wall a few times, he accepted that he would not disappear into walls. In the same way, he accepted that his father could disappear into walls. But he was not in the least disturbed by desire to find out the reason for the difference between his father and himself. Logic and physics were no part of his mental makeup. Like most creatures of the wild, he early experienced famine. There came a time when not only did the meat supply cease, but the milk no longer came from his mother's breast. At first, the cubs whimpered and cried, but for the most part they slept. It was not long before they were reduced to a coma of hunger. There were no more spats and squabbles, no more tiny rages, no attempts at growling. While the adventures toward the far white wall ceased altogether, the cubs slept while the life that was in them flickered and died down. One eye was desperate. He ranged far and wide and slept but little in the lair that had now become cheerless and miserable. The she-wolf too left her litter and went out in search of meat. In the first days after the birth of the cubs, one eye had journeyed several times back to the Indian camp and robbed the rabbit snares. But with the melting of the snow and the opening of the streams, the Indian camp had moved away and that source of supply was closed to him. When the grey cub came back to life and again took interest in the far white wall, he found that the population of his world had been reduced. Only one sister remained to him, the rest were gone. As he grew stronger, he found himself compelled to play alone, for the sister no longer lifted her head, nor moved about. His little body rounded out with the meat he now ate, but the food had come too late for her. She slept continuously, a tiny skeleton flung around with skin in which the flame flickered lower and lower and at last went out. Then there came a time when the grey cub no longer saw his father appearing and disappearing in the wall, nor lying down asleep in the entrance. This had happened at the end of a second and less severe famine. And the she-wolf knew why one eye never came back but there was no way by which she could tell what she had seen to the grey cub. 
hunting herself for meat up the left fork of the stream where lived the lynx she had followed a day old trail of one eye and she had found him or what remained of him at the end of the trail there were many signs of the battle that had been fought and of the lynx's withdrawal to her lair after having won the victory before she went away the she-wolf had found this lair but the signs told her that the lynx was inside and she had not dared to venture in after that the she-wolf in her hunting avoided the left fork for she knew that in the lynx's lair was a litter of kittens and she knew the lynx for a fierce bad-tempered creature and a terrible fighter it was all very well for half a dozen wolves to drive a lynx spinning and bristling up a tree but it was quite a different matter for a lone wolf to encounter a lynx especially when the lynx was known to have a litter of hungry kittens at her back but the wild is the wild and motherhood is motherhood at all times fiercely protective whether in the wild or out of it and the time was to come when the she-wolf for her grey cub's sake would venture the left fork and the lair in the rocks and the lynx's wrath Chapter 4 The Wall of the World By the time his mother began leaving the cave on hunting expeditions, the cub had learned well the law that forbade his approaching the entrance. Not only had this law been forcibly and many times impressed on him by his mother's nose and paw, but in him the instinct of fear was developing. Never in his brief cave life had he encountered anything of which to be afraid. Yet fear was in him. It had come down to him from a remote ancestry through a thousand, thousand lives. It was a heritage he had received directly from One Eye and the She-Wolf. But to them, in turn, it had been passed down through all the generations of wolves that had gone before fear that legacy of the wild which no animal may escape no exchange for pottage so the great cub knew fear though he knew not the stuff of which fear was made possibly he accepted it as one of the restrictions of life for he had already learned that there were such restrictions hunger he had known and when he could not appease his hunger, he had felt restriction, the hard obstruction of the cave wall, the sharp nudge of his mother's nose, the smashing stroke of a paw, and the hunger unappeased of several famines had borne in upon him that all was not freedom in the world, that to life there was limitations and restraints. These limitations and restraints were laws. To be obedient to them was to escape hurt and make for happiness. He did not reason the question out in this man fashion. He merely classified the thing that hurt and the things that did not hurt. And after such classification, he avoided the things that hurt, the restrictions and restraints in order to enjoy the satisfactions and remunerations of life. Thus it was that in obedience to the law laid down by his mother, and in obedience to the law of that unknown and nameless thing, fear, he kept away from the mouth of the cave. It remained to him a white wall of light, when his mother was absent, he slept most of the time, while during the intervals that he was awake, he kept very quiet, suppressing the whimpering cries that tickled in his throat and strove for noise. 
Once, lying awake, he heard a strange sound in the white wall. He did not know that it was a wolverine standing outside, all a-trembling with its own daring and cautiously scenting out the contents of the cave. The cub knew only that the sniff was strange. It's something unclassified, therefore unknown and terrible, for the unknown was one of the chief elements that went into the making of fear. The hair bristled upon the grey cub's back, but it bristled silently. How was he to know that this thing that sniffed was a thing at which to bristle? It was not born of any knowledge of his, yet it was the visible expression of the fear that was in him, and for which, in his own life, there was no accounting. But fear was accompanied by another instinct, that of concealment. The cub was in a frenzy of terror, yet he lay without movement or sound, frozen, petrified into immobility, to all appearances, dead. His mother, coming home, growled as she smelled the wolverine's track, and bounded into the cave and licked and nozzled him with undue vehemence of affection and the cub felt that somehow he had escaped a great hurt. But there were other forces at work in the cub, the greatest of which was growth. Instinct and law demanded of him obedience, but growth demanded disobedience. His mother and fear impelled him to keep away from the white wall. Growth is life and life is forever destined to make for light. So, and there was no damming up the tide of life that was rising within him, rising with every mouthful of meat he swallowed, with every breath he drew. In the end, one day, fear and obedience were swept away by the rush of life, and the cub straddled and sprawled toward the entrance. Unlike any other wall with which he had had experience, this wall seemed to recede from him as he approached. No hard surface collided with the tender little nose he thrust out tentatively before him. The substance of the wall seemed as permeable and yielding as light and as condition in his eyes had the seeming of form, so he entered into what had been wall to him and bathed in the substance that composed it. It was bewildering. He was sprawling through solidity, and ever the light grew brighter. Fear urged him to go back, but growth drove him on. Suddenly he found himself at the mouth of the cave, the wall inside which he had thought himself, as suddenly leaped back before him to an immeasurable distance. The light had become painfully bright. He was dazzled by it. Likewise, he was made dizzy by this abrupt and tremendous extension of space. Automatically, his eyes were adjusting themselves to the brightness, focusing themselves to meet the increased distance of objects. At first, the wall had leapt beyond his vision. He now saw it again, but it had taken upon itself a remarkable remoteness. Also, its appearance had changed. It was now a variegated wall composed of the trees that fringed the stream, the opposing mountain that towered above the trees, and the sky that outtowered the mountain. A great fear came upon him. This was more of the terrible unknown. He crouched down on the lip of the cave and gazed out on the world. He was very much afraid. Because it was unknown, it was hostile to him. Therefore, the hair stood up on end along his back, and his lips wrinkled weakly in an attempt at a ferocious and intimidating snarl. 
Out of his puniness and fright, he challenged and menaced the whole wide world. Nothing happened. He continued to gaze, and in his interest he forgot to snarl. Also he forgot to be afraid. For the time, fear had been routed by growth, while growth had assumed the guise of curiosity. He began to notice near objects. An open portion of the stream that flashed in the sun, the blasted pine tree that stood at the base of the slope, and the slope itself that ran right up to him and ceased two feet beneath the lip of the cave on which he crouched. Now the grey cub had lived all his days on a level floor. He had never experienced the hurt of a fall. He did not know what a fall was, so he stepped boldly out upon the air. His hind leg still rested on the cave lip, so he fell forward, head downward. The earth struck him a harsh blow on the nose that made him yelp. Then he began rolling down the slope, over and over. He was in a panic of terror. The unknown had caught him at last. It had gripped savagely hold of him and was about to wreak upon him some terrific hurt. Growth was now routed by fear, and he keyed like any frightened puppy. The unknown bore him on he knew not to what frightful hurt, and he yelped and keyed unceasingly. This was a different proposition from crouching in frozen fear, while the unknown lurked just alongside. Now the unknown had caught tight hold of him. Silence would do no good. Besides, it was not fear, but terror that convulsed him. But the slope grew more gradual, and its base was grass-covered. Here the cub lost momentum. When at last he came to a stop, he gave one last agonized yell, and then a long, whimpering wail. Also, and quite as a matter of course, as though in his life he had already made a thousand toilets, he proceeded to lick away the dry clay that soiled him. After that he sat up and gazed about him as might the first man of the earth who landed upon Mars. The cub had broken through the wall of the world, the unknown had let go its hold of him, and here he was without hurt. But the first man on Mars would have experienced less unfamiliarity than did he. Without any antecedent knowledge, without any warning whatever that such existed, he found himself an explorer in a totally new world. Now that the terrible unknown had let go of him, he forgot that the unknown had any terrors. He was aware only of curiosity in all the things about him. He inspected the grass beneath him, the mossberry plant just beyond, and the dead trunk of the blasted pine that stood on the edge of an open space among the trees. A squirrel running round the base of the trunk came full upon him, and gave him a great fright. He cowered down and snarled, but the squirrel was as badly scared. It ran up the tree, and from a point of safety, chattered back savagely. This helped the cub's courage, and though the woodpecker he next encountered gave him a start, he proceeded confidently on his way. Such was his confidence that when a moose bird impudently hopped up to him, he reached out at it with a playful paw. The result was a sharp peck on the end of his nose that made him cower down and key. 
The noise he made was too much for the moose bird who sought safety in flight. But the cub was learning. His misty little mind had already made an unconscious classification. There were live things and things not alive. Also, he must watch out for the live things. The things not alive remained always in one place. But the live things moved about. And there was no telling what they might do. The thing to expect of them was the unexpected. And for this, he must be prepared. He traveled very clumsily. He ran into sticks and things. A twig that he thought a long way off would the next instant hit him on the nose or rake along his ribs. There were inequalities of surface. Sometimes he overstepped and stubbed his nose. Quite as often as he understepped and stubbed his feet. Then there were the pebbles and stones that turned under him when he trod upon them. And from them he came to know that the things not alive were not all in the same state of stable equilibrium as was his cave. Also, that small things not alive were more liable than large things to fall down or turn over. But with every mishap he was learning. The longer he walked, the better he walked. He was adjusting himself. He was learning to calculate his own muscular movements, to know his physical limitations, to measure distance between objects, and between objects and himself. His was the luck of the beginner, born to be a hunter of meat, though he did not know it. He blundered upon meat just outside his own cave door on his first foray into the world. It was by sheer blundering that he chanced upon the shrewdly hidden ptarmigan nest. He fell into it. He had essayed to walk along the trunk of a fallen pine. The rotten bark gave way under his feet, and with a despairing yelp he pitched down the rounded crescent, smashed through the leafage and stalks of a small bush, and in the heart of the bush, on the ground, fetched up in the midst of seven ptarmigan chicks. They made noises, and at first he was frightened at them. Then he perceived that they were very little, and he became bolder. They moved. He placed his paw on one, and its movements were accelerated. This was a source of enjoyment to him. He smelt it. He picked it up in his mouth. It struggled and tickled his nose. At the same time, he was made aware of a sensation of hunger. His jaws closed together. There was a crunching of fragile bones, and warm blood ran in his mouth. The taste of it was good. This was meat, the same as his mother gave him, only it was alive between his teeth, and therefore better. So he ate the ptarmigan, nor did he stop till he had devoured the whole brood. Then he licked his chops in quite the same way his mother did, and began to crawl out of the bush. He encountered a feathered whirlwind. He was confused and blinded by the rush of it and the beat of angry wings. He hid his head between his paws and yelped. The blows increased. The mother ptarmigan was in a fury. Then he became angry. He rose up, snarling, striking out with his paws. He sank his tiny teeth into one of the wings and pulled and tugged sturdily. The ptarmigan struggled against him, showering blows upon him with her free wing. It was his first battle. He was elated. He forgot all about the unknown. He no longer was afraid of anything. He was fighting, tearing at a live thing that was striking at him. Also, this live thing was meat. The lust to kill was on him. 
he had just destroyed little live things, he would now destroy a big live thing. He was too busy and happy to know that he was happy. He was thrilling and exulting in ways new to him and greater to him than any he had known before. He held on to the ring and growled between his tight clenched teeth. The ptarmigan dragged him out of the bush. Then she turned and tried to drag him back into the bush's shelter. He pulled her away from it and on into the open. And all the time she was making outcry and striking with the free wing, while feathers were flying like snowfall. The pitch to which he was aroused was tremendous. All the fighting blood of his breed was up in him and surging through him. This was living, though he did not know it. He was realizing his own meaning in the world. He was doing that for which he was made, killing meat and battling to kill it. He was justifying his existence, than which life can do no greater, for life achieves its summit when it does to the uttermost that which it was equipped to do. After a time, the ptarmigan ceased her struggling. He still held her by the wing, and they lay on the ground and looked at each other. He tried to growl threateningly, ferociously. She pecked on his nose, which by now, what of previous adventures, was sore. He winced, but held on. She pecked him again and again. From wincing he went to whimpering. He tried to back away from her, oblivious to the fact that by his hold on her he dragged her after him. A rain of pecks fell on his ill-used nose. The flood of fight ebbed down in him, and releasing his prey, he turned tail and scampered on across the open, in inglorious retreat. He lay down to rest on the other side of the open, near the edge of the bushes, his tongue lulling out, his chest heaving and panting, his nose still hurting him and causing him to continue his whimper. But as he lay there, suddenly there came to him a feeling as of something terrible impending. The unknown with all its terror rushed upon him, and he shrank back instinctively into the shelter of the bush. As he did so, a draft of air fanned him, and a large, ringed body swept ominously and silently past. A hawk, driving down out of the blue, had barely missed him. While he lay in the bush, recovering from his fright and peering fearfully out, the mother ptarmigan on the other side of the open space flooded out of the ravaged nest. It was because of her loss that she paid no attention to the winged bolt of the sky. But the cub saw, and it was a warning and lesson to him, the swift downward swoop of the hawk, the short skim of its body just above the ground, the strike of its talons in the body of the ptarmigan, the ptarmigan squawk of agony and fright and the hawks rush upward into the blue, carrying the ptarmigan away with it. It was a long time before the cub left its shelter. He had learned much. Live things were meat. They were good to eat. Also, live things, when they were large enough, could give hurt. It was better to eat small live things, like ptarmigan chicks, and to let alone large live things like ptarmigan hens. Nevertheless, he felt a little prick of ambition, a sneaking desire to have another battle with that ptarmigan hen. Only the hawk had carried her away. Maybe there were other ptarmigan hens. He would go and see. He came down a shelving bank to the stream. 
He had never seen water before. The footing looked good. There were no inequalities of surface. He stepped boldly out on it and went down, crying with fear, into the embrace of the unknown. It was cold, and he gasped, breathing quickly. The water rushed into his lungs instead of the air that had always accompanied his act of breathing. The suffocation he experienced was like the pang of death. To him it signified death. He had no conscious knowledge of death, but like every animal of the wild, he possessed the instinct of death. To him it stood as the greatest of hurts. It was the very essence of the unknown. It was the sum of the terrors of the unknown. The one culminating and unthinkable catastrophe that could happen to him. About which he knew nothing and about which he feared everything. He came to the surface and the sweet air rushed into his open mouth. He did not go down again. Quite as though it had been a long established custom of his, he struck out with all his legs and began to swim. The near bank was a yard away, but he had come up with his back to it, and the first thing his eyes rested upon was the opposite bank, toward which he immediately began to swim. The stream was a small one, but in the pool it widened out to a score of feet. Midway in the passage, the current picked up the cub and swept him downstream. He was caught in the miniature rapid at the bottom of the pool. Here was little chance for swimming. The quiet water had become suddenly angry. Sometimes he was under, sometimes on top. At all times he was in violent motion, now being turned over or around and again being smashed against a rock. And with every rock he struck, he yelped. His progress was a series of yelps, from which might have been adduced the number of rocks he encountered. Below the rapid was a second pool, and here, captured by the eddy, he was gently borne to the bank, and as gently deposited on a bed of gravel. He crawled frantically clear of the water and lay down. He had learned some more about the world. Water was not alive, yet it moved. Also it looked as solid as the earth, but was without any solidity at all. His conclusion was that things were not always what they appeared to be. The cub's fear of the unknown was an inherited distrust, and it had now been strengthened by experience. Thenceforth, in the nature of things, he would possess an abiding distrust of appearances. He would have to learn the reality of a thing before he could put his faith into it. One other adventure was destined for him that day. He had recollected that there was such a thing in the world as his mother, and then there came to him a feeling that he wanted her more than all the rest of the things in the world. Not only was his body tired with the adventures he had undergone, but his little brain was equally tired. In all the days he had lived it had not worked so hard as on this one day. Furthermore, he was sleepy. So he started out to look for the cave and his mother, feeling at the same time an overwhelming rush of loneliness and helplessness. He was sprawling along between some bushes when he heard a sharp, intimidating cry. There was a flash of yellow before his eyes. He saw a weasel leaping swiftly away from him. It was a small live thing, and he had no fear. Then, before him, at his feet, he saw an extremely small live thing, only several inches long. A young weasel that, like himself, had disobediently gone out adventuring. It tried to retreat before him, 
He turned it over with his paw. It made a queer, grating noise. The next moment the flash of yellow reappeared before his eyes. He heard again the intimidating cry and at the same instant received a sharp blow on the side of the neck and felt the sharp teeth of the mother weasel cut into his flesh. While he yelped and keyed and scrambled backward, he saw the mother weasel leap upon her young one and disappear with it into the neighboring thicket. The cut of her teeth in his neck still hurt, but his feelings were hurt more grievously and he sat down and weakly whimpered. This mother weasel was so small and so savage. He was yet to learn that for size and weight the weasel was the most ferocious, vindictive, and terrible of all the killers of the wild. But a portion of this knowledge was quickly to be his. He was still whimpering when the mother weasel reappeared. She did not rush him. Now that her young one was safe, she approached more cautiously, and the cub had full opportunity to observe her lean, snake-like body and her head erect, eager, and snake-like itself. Her sharp, menacing cries and the hair bristling along his back and he snarled warningly at her. She came closer and closer. There was a leap, swifter than his unpractised sight, and the lean yellow body disappeared for a moment out of the field of his vision. The next moment she was at his throat, her teeth buried in his hair and flesh. At first he snarled and tried to fight, but he was very young, and this was only his first day in the world, and his snarl became a whimper, his fight, a struggle to escape. The weasel never relaxed her hold. She hung on, striving to press down with her teeth to the great vein where his lifeblood bubbled. The weasel was a drinker of blood, and it was ever her preference to drink from the throat of life itself. The grey cub would have died, and there would have been no story to write about him had not the she-wolf come bounding through the bushes. The weasel let go the cub and flashed at the she-wolf's throat, missing but getting a hold on the jaw instead. The she-wolf flirted her head like the snap of a whip, breaking the weasel's hold and flinging it high in the air. And, still in the air, the she-wolf's jaws closed on the lean yellow body, and the weasel knew death between the crunching teeth. The cub experienced another access of affection on the part of his mother. Her joy at finding him seemed even greater than his joy at being found. She nuzzled him and caressed him and licked the cuts made in him by the weasel's teeth. Then, between them, mother and cub, they ate the blood drinker and after that went back to the cave and slept. Chapter 5 On the Law of the Meat The cub's development was rapid. He rested for two days and then ventured forth from the cave again. It was on this adventure that he found the young weasel whose mother he had helped eat, and he saw to it that the young weasel went the way of its mother. But on this trip he did not get lost. When he grew tired he found his way back to the cave and slept. And every day thereafter found him out and ranging a wider area. He began to get accurate measurement of his strength and his weakness. And to know when to be bold and when to be cautious. He found it expedient to be cautious all the time 
except for the rare moments when, assured of his own trepidity, he abandoned himself to petty rages and lusts. He was always a little demon of fury when he chanced upon a stray ptarmigan. Never did he fail to respond savagely to the chatter of the squirrel he had first met on the blasted pine. While the sight of a moose bird almost invariably put him into the wildest of rages, for he never forgot the peck on the nose he had received from the first of that ilk he encountered. But there were times when even a moose bird failed to affect him, and those were times when he felt himself to be in danger from some other prowling meat hunter. He never forgot the hawk and its moving shadow, always sent him crouching into the nearest thicket. He no longer sprawled and straddled, and already he was developing the gait of his mother, slinking and furtive, apparently without exertion, yet sliding along with a swiftness that was as deceptive as it was imperceptible. In the matter of meat, his luck had been all in the beginning. The seven ptarmigan chicks and the baby weasel represented the sum of his killings. His desire to kill strengthened with the days, and he cherished hungry ambitions for the squirrel that chattered so volubly, and always informed all wild creatures that the wolf cub was approaching. But as birds flew in the air, squirrels could climb trees, and the cub could only try to crawl unobserved upon the squirrel when it was on the ground. The cub entertained a great respect for his mother. She could get meat, and she never failed to bring him his share. Further, she was unafraid of things. It did not occur to him that this fearlessness was founded upon experience and knowledge. Its effect on him was that of an impression of power. His mother represented power, and as he grew older he felt this power in the sharper admonishment of her paw, while the reproving nudge of her nose gave place to the slash of her fangs. For this, likewise, he respected his mother. She compelled obedience from him, and the older he grew, the shorter grew her temper. Famine came again, and the cub, with clearer consciousness, knew once more the bite of hunger. The she-wolf ran herself thin in the quest for meat. She rarely slept any more in the cave, spending most of her time on the meat trail, and spending it vainly. This famine was not a long one, but it was severe while it lasted. The cub found no more milk in his mother's breast, nor did he get one mouthful of meat for himself. Before he had hunted in play, for the sheer joyousness of it, now he hunted in deadly earnestness and found nothing, yet the failure of it accelerated his development. He studied the habits of the squirrel with greater carefulness, and strove with greater craft to steal upon it and surprise it. He studied the wood mice and tried to dig them out of their burrows, and he learned much about the ways of moose birds and woodpeckers. And there came a day when the hawk's shadow did not drive him crouching into bushes. He had grown stronger and wiser and more confident. Also, he was desperate. So he sat on his haunches, conspicuously in an open space, and challenged the hawk down out of the sky. For he knew that there, floating in the blue above him, was meat, the meat his stomach yearned after so insistently. But the hawk refused to come down and give battle, and the cub crawled away into a thicket and whimpered his disappointment and hunger. The famine broke, the she-wolf brought home meat, 
It was strange meat, different from any she had ever brought before. It was a lynx kitten, partly grown like the cub, but not so large. And it was all for him, as mother had satisfied her hunger elsewhere, though he did not know that it was the rest of the lynx litter that had gone to satisfy her. Nor did he know the desperateness of her deed. He knew only that the velvet furry kitten was meat, and he ate and waxed happier with every mouthful. A full stomach conduces to inaction, and the cub lay in the cave, sleeping against his mother's side. He was aroused by her snarling. Never had he heard her snarl so terribly. Possibly in her whole life it was the most terrible snarl she ever gave. There was reason for it, and none knew it better than she. A lynx's lair is not despoiled with impunity. In the full glare of the afternoon light, crouching in the entrance of the cave, and the cub saw the lynx mother. The hair rippled up along his back at the sight. Here was fear, and it did not require his instinct to tell him of it. And if sight alone were not sufficient, the cry of rage the intruder gave, beginning with a snarl and rushing abruptly upward in a hoarse screech, was convincing enough in itself. The cub felt the prod of the life that was in him, and stood up, and snarled valiantly by his mother's side. But she thrust him ignominiously away and behind her. Because of the low roofed entrance, the lynx could not leap in, and when she made a crawling rush of it, the she-wolf sprang upon her and pinned her down. The cub saw little of the battle. There was a tremendous snarling and spinning and screeching. The two animals thrashed about, the lynx ripping and tearing with her claws and using her teeth as well, while the she-wolf used her teeth alone. Once the cub sprang in and sank his teeth into the hind leg of the lynx. He clung on, growling savagely. Though he did not know it, by the weight of his body, he clogged the action of the leg and thereby saved his mother much damage. A change in the battle crushed him under both their bodies and wrenched loose his hold. The next moment the two mothers separated, and before they rushed together again, the lynx lashed out at the cub with a huge forepaw that ripped his shoulder open to the bone and sent him hurtling sideways against the wall. Then was added to the uproar the cub's shrill yelp of pain and fright. But the fight lasted so long that he had time to cry himself out and to experience a second burst of courage and the end of the battle found him again clinging to a hind leg and furiously growling between his teeth. The lynx was dead. But the she-wolf was very weak and sick. At first she caressed the cub and licked his wounded shoulder, but the blood she had lost had taken with it her strength and for all of the day and the night she lay by her dead foe's side, without movement, scarcely breathing. For a week she never left the cave except for water, and then her movements were slow and painful. At the end of that time the lynx was devoured while the she-wolf's wounds had healed sufficiently to permit her to take the meat trail again. The cub's shoulder was stiff and sore, and for some time he limped from the terrible slash he had received. But the world now seemed changed. He went about in it with greater confidence, with a feeling of prowess that had not been his in the days before the battle with the lynx. 
he had looked upon life in a more ferocious aspect. He had fought, he had buried his teeth in the flesh of a foe, and he had survived. And because of all this, he carried himself more boldly, with a touch of defiance that was new in him. He was no longer afraid of minor things, and much of his timidity had vanished, though the unknown never ceased to press upon him with its mysteries and terrors, intangible and ever menacing. He began to accompany his mother on the meat trail, and he saw much of the killing of meat and began to play his part in it. And in his own dim way he learned the law of meat. There were two kinds of life, his own kind and the other kind. His own kind included his mother and himself, the other kind included all live things that moved. But the other kind was divided. One portion was what his own kind killed and ate. This portion was composed of the non-killers and the small killers. The other portion killed and ate his own kind, or was killed and eaten by his own kind. And out of this classification arose the law. The aim of life was meat. Life itself was meat. Life lived on life. There were the eaters and the eaten. The law was eat or be eaten. He did not formulate the law in clear, set terms and moralize about it. He did not even think the law. He merely lived the law without thinking about it at all. He saw the law operating around him on every side. He had eaten the ptarmigan chicks. The hawk had eaten the ptarmigan mother. The hawk would also have eaten him. Later, when he had grown more formidable, he wanted to eat the hawk. He had eaten the lynx kitten. The lynx mother would have eaten him had she not herself been killed and eaten. And so it went. The law was being lived about him by all live things. And he himself was part and parcel of the law. He was a killer. His only food was meat, live meat, that ran away swiftly before him, or flew into the air, or climbed trees, or hid the ground, or faced him, and fought with him, or turned the tables and ran after him. Had the cub thought in man fashion, he might have epitomized life as a ferocious appetite, and the world is a place wherein ranged a multitude of appetites, pursuing and being pursued, hunting and being hunted, eating and being eaten, all in blindness and confusion, with violence and disorder, a chaos of gluttony and slaughter, ruled over by chance, merciless, planless, endless. But the cub did not think in man fashion. He did not look at things with wide vision. He was single-purposed and entertained but one thought or desire at a time. Besides the law of meat, there were a myriad other and lesser laws for him to learn and obey. The world was filled with surprise. The stir of the life that was in him the play of his muscles was an unending happiness. To run down meat was to experience thrills and elations. His rages and battles were pleasures. Terror itself and the mystery of the unknown led to his living. And there were easements and satisfactions. To have a full stomach, to doze lazily in the sunshine, such things were remuneration in full for his ardors and toils. While his ardors and toils were in themselves self-remunerative, they were expressions of life, and life is always happy when it is expressing itself. 
So the cub had no quarrel with his hostile environment. He was very much alive, very happy, and very proud of himself. <laughs>